Hello, welcome to a brief introduction to lung ultrasound. Specifically, this is going to focus on anatomy and sort of the how-to. The first question I want to answer though is why. Um, traditionally, people always thought that the lung was a terrible organ to ultrasound. It's full of air. Air tends to scatter ultrasound beams, which made it seem as though this would be the toughest possible thing to scan. For decades, people had been doing echocardiograms and looking at the heart, and the lung was just an annoying thing that came in the way. Then there was a brilliant and eccentric intensivist out in Switzerland who figured out that there was actually a way of using the artifacts that were created by the ultrasound beams themselves to figure out what normal and abnormal anatomy looks like. So we'll talk about a lot of that today. The first question I want to address was why? Why even bother, right? Like we have all of these other imaging modalities to look at the lungs. Why, why don't we just do those? So I'm going to try to break it down by looking at the three clinical questions that we usually ask by doing lung ultrasound. And there's many more you can choose to use, but these are the three most common ones. And we'll start by looking to see if you're looking for, let's say, a pneumothorax. So the pneumothorax, right there you can see, so brief walkthrough and chest x-rays. That's clavicle there, clavicle there. You have ribs up here. And then you'd expect to see kind of like this approach here where you see the lung margin all the way out and you see these small white sort of patchy spots there. And that's just lung parenchyma that's appropriately filled throughout the whole space. And um, then on this side when you look you actually see that there's, there's, they're not extending out there. And the lung parenchyma is kind of out here. So this would be a pneumothorax. There's air within the, within the uh, Flora that's causing the visceral and parietal flora to separate, causing the lung itself to collapse. And this is a pneumothorax, and you can start to see that the heart, which should kind of be over here, is maybe maybe starting to shift a little bit over. It's not quite all the way to true tension physiology, but it's headed there. So the number underneath here, 39%, is what the sensitivity of chest x-ray is thought to be for diagnosing all pneumothoraces which, in case you don't remember your basic statistics, is pretty terrible. This x-ray on the side here is an x-ray of essentially what looks like pneumonia. You can see sort of these diffuse opacities all over, this big white fluffy stuff that's kind of just stuffed all over, and the sensitivity of that is pretty terrible, 27%. And then if you look at this x-ray over here, this is a diagnosis of heart failure, and you can see sort of just this vascular space that comes off the pulmonary vessels, and it looks a little congested. Um, as a reminder, this is not really a walk through chest x-rays. There's a lot of other resources that should hopefully make you do that. The sensitivity of diagnosing heart failure and chest x-ray is thought to be at best 73%. So that leads to why. Now let's talk about how. So the first thing we're going to talk about is that there are a billion ways, that's not quite a scientific number, but there are a lot of ways to scan the lungs. There's a hundred different protocols you could choose to follow and each of them have their own slight variation. The simplest one that we tend to follow that is um, not universal throughout the entire hospital but is generally approached by most of uh, the clinicians who will be teaching you is this approach that essentially splits the lung into four zones. So you'll see that you start, the split happens at around where the sternum would be and it goes to the anterior axillary line and then that area is subdivided by just below the nipple line or the inframammary crease into zone one and zone two. Then you have zone 3 and zone 4 here, separated by the posterior axillary line. This comes up because we're going to talk about what a lung zone is when it comes up shortly. Okay, so let's say you're going to scan this spot. So how exactly would you scan it? Now, just like most other things we've done, the probe marker is going to be either towards the head or patient right. In this case, it's always going to be towards the head. If you're holding the probe this way, you're putting the probe down with it vertically oriented you're going to get this view, where basically if the ribs are running across the chest like this, instead you're going to see a rib here and a rib here, because you're, you're perpendicular to the way they're running, so you'll see multiple ribs. So your probe marker is oriented up, So and probe marker, as a reminder, this dot here will correspond to this here. So you'll see a rib and a rib, and then up here you're seeing subcutaneous tissue, skin and subcutaneous tissue, Headed down here, you'll see muscles. So if you have a particularly muscular person, they will often have thick pectoral muscles, and you'll see just big, thick muscle here, and this can be deeper. And then the reason the ribs are sort of a critical sign is because you're looking for the pleural line between them. Because there's a lot of things that can be a single bright line. The pleura can be best found by first identifying the two ribs and seeing a bright line between them. 
because otherwise you can be fooled by seeing just a random bright line somewhere within the patient's chest wall. And the pleura should shadow, and uh, the pleura should shimmer back and forth as the patient breathes. Now, the other artifact that you're looking for is something called an A-line, and I won't sort of trap you into the physics of it, but an A-line is when this pleural line is basically reflected down here. And the brief example of why that's happening is the pleural line here is actually the, ver the parietal and the visceral pleura both. And what's happening is that the sound beam, when it hits it, because these two are hyper-reflective surfaces with a tiny amount of fluid between them, most of the sound waves get trapped within there. A lot get reflected speedily, which makes this hyperechoic or bright, but then some of them will escape after a certain number of reverberations within the pleural line. And that certain number of reverberations gives you these horizontal artifacts called A-lines. Because the machine interprets it, that means that that escaped reverberation that's coming later means that there's another bright line down here. There's something else here that's hyper-reflective. And then it'll think the same thing further. And then it'll think the same thing further. And an A-line is normal. Expecting to see that is completely expected. Okay. The other thing you'll hear people describe this exact view of seeing rib, rib, and pleural line is called the bat sign. And that's just a bat to show you what that would kind of look like. Okay, moving on. We're going to look at what this looks like in real life. So, you'll see here there's rib there. There's rib barely visible down here at the bottom of the screen. And then this is pleura. And you can see that the pleural line is shimmering back and forth, back and forth. So now we're going to talk about the various use cases and which probe we use and why. So for the first use case, we'll go back to that chest x-ray of pneumothorax. And again, not a chest x-ray lecture, but you can see right here that this sort of faint line is actually the lung, the lung marking ends here. You can see there's a very well demarcated end of the lung. And then this area that has nothing in it, all you can see is the posterior ribs beautifully. This is sort of all pneumothorax. Now, this probe here is called the linear probe or a high frequency probe. Uh, you may have seen this before. A high frequency probe is wonderful because it gives you very beautiful images. It gives you detailed, crisp, data rich images, and it uses a high frequency sound beam to do so. The, the drawback is the beams don't go very far because of the frequency being high, right? So what this means is it is great at looking at superficial structures, like say the pleura. Because as a brief reminder, remember that any pneumothorax, you have air between that pleural line. So now the thing that you would see, the sliding, which is the two pleura, the visceral and the parietal pleura, moving in opposition to each other, has gone away. So that means that if the sliding is gone, that would be that's because there's air in the space, usually. There are other reasons why that can happen, which we'll get into at a later date. So this, as a reminder, is what sliding looks like. So there's a rib there rib down here. We're not going to run through that too many times. And then right here is your pleural space. And then when you see it going, what you're looking to see is this sort of shimmering line that's just going to move back and forth, back and forth. That's what lung sliding looks like. All right. Moving on, we're going to move on to what it looks like when you use the curvilinear probe. Now, the reminder, the curvilinear probe is curved. It is a lower frequency probe than the linear probe, but it is a higher frequency probe than the phase ring probe. It gives you a great view of things that are deep. Um, it also has this sort of broad footprint, so it's sometimes a little harder to fit between the lungs. And this is a chest x-ray that just looks like a raging pneumonia. There's, if you look through, so this is where your lung fields are. And as opposed to the previous x-ray with the normal side that we saw, you just see that there's a whole bunch of extra schmutz in here, for lack of a better description. And all of that extra stuff could, has a wide differential, right? Like just seeing a bunch of opacities on chest x-ray does not make a pneumonia. And a pneumonia in and of itself is actually a surprisingly tough clinical diagnosis to make. But we'll talk about that more. So if you were to ultrasound the patient, this is my, what you might see. So as you can see, you're using a curvilinear probe. And this is, again, a normal ultrasound. So you'd see right here is skin and subcutaneous tissue. There is muscle. Now, compare this to the last one we saw. You see how deep this image is going? It's down all the way to 14 centimeters. The previous one tapped out at around 4. You can see right up here is pleura, and there's rib, and there's rib. Now, we're sliding down the chest wall, so there's rib again. And you can kind of see that the pleura is moving, but it's a lot harder to notice that. You have to sort of focus on it and relax. What this is great at doing is looking deep and saying that, hey, I don't see that there's an area that looks frankly abnormal. 
So there's rib, there's rib, there's pleura. This looks like a reverberation artifact or an A-line. And an A-line is, as we said, normal. But we don't see anything that looks frankly abnormal. But if we were to see it, this is sort of the depth in the region in which we would see it. All right. Third, we're going to move on to the next indication that we talked about, which is looking for pulmonary edema. So you'd see sort of this diffuse, again, like a whole bunch of stuff in the periphery. But the, the differentiating factor in the x-ray here is that there's these areas of pulmonary vascular congestion that you can notice. And a lot of folks like to use the phased array probe for this. Now, the phased array probe, as a reminder, is a lower frequency probe, and it's got this unique sort of square footprint. It's primarily used to look at the heart and to do echocardiography, and it's optimized for that. Now, my bias is to say that I prefer to use the curve the linear probe or the curve probe we saw before for this indication as well, but some of my critical care colleagues much prefer the phased array probe for this. All right. So this is sort of what the phased array probe will look like. If you start up here, this is skin there, soft tissue there, and then here you can make out what looks like the pleura, and then if you see sort of this bright white shadow that appears here, this bright white line that starts up at the pleura and kind of extends all the way down, that would be what we call a B line. We'll talk about that more to follow. So just as a reminder, this is a very brief introduction of what the various types of normals in general look like. We'll talk more about abnormals in the next little video, and it's to talk about how the ultrasound works for lung ultrasound. It's to talk about the basic anatomy. And unfortunately, I won't be able to show you much pathology in your second year on the standardized patients you'll be seeing. There might be a patient or two with a beeline, but the exciting thing is that when you hit third year, we have a whole curriculum plan where you get to see high fidelity simulators and get to experience this all over again. All right. Um, so if you have questions, this is my email. Feel free to shoot them to shoot them my way, and then uh, I will talk to you in the next video.